The first algorithm we want to talk about is breadth first search. This is our the simpler one, the one that most people probably could invent on their own if they stared at it for long enough. Depth first search maybe isn't more complicated, but this one it reads a little bit better in English. I have this in very English based pseudocode here because there's some fiddly details that will obfuscate what the algorithm is trying to do. So what does breadth first search do? We're going to go through this line by line. It searches a graph G starting at S. The way that it searches the graph is it starts off by just saying every vertex in the graph, I've never heard of them. So it says that these are all undiscovered. And then it will say I'm going to start searching at that vertex S that you gave me. S meaning start. So you say, I don't know where anything is. And then at the very start, I say, OK, I know where S is. You told me that's a vertex. So we start our search at S. We're then going to keep track of the vertices we need to look at, the places we have yet to visit in a queue. This is that a, a structure where the first thing put in is the first thing out. So if you have a Q, one, two, three, eight, you take the element from the front of it, and then everything scoots to the left. This is often implemented as a linked list or some other similar data structure. We, we will assume it's a linked list for our purposes. So we have a Q that represents the vertices in the graph that we have yet, yet to visit. So at the start here, the Q, will equal only S. And then we go until we run out of vertices we haven't visited. So until that queue is empty, we're going to say get the first thing from the queue. So we take S out of the queue and then find everything adjacent to S. So we are starting S, looking at everything directly adjacent to it. And then we will keep exploring from those vertices. We'll see an example of this in a second to sort of understand what's happening, but that's the idea. You start at some vertex, look at everything adjacent, and then proceed in like manner from each of those vertices. Let's look at the code and see how we do this, because there's this little thing where we need to keep track of if we've started at a vertex, we're in the middle of understanding what where that vertex goes, or if we're totally done with the vertex. The way we're going to do this is by coloring the vertices. So we can color vertices to encode information. We're going to color them so that white corresponds to undiscovered. Gray is processing, so we are still looking at that. And black is finished. That's one thing we need to add. The other thing is it is going to turn out to be helpful to keep track of the edges that we use. That will tell some very useful information about the graph. So at each vertex, we're also going to store a little parent pointer to help us make a tree later. So we're going to have this thing called pi. That is the parent pointer pi because it's the Greek letter for P, P for parent. So we're going to have two things, a color that we're going to be adjusting and this parent pointer. So now with sort of the background there, let's look at the actual code and walk through it for a little bit. So here's our actual code. We'll zoom out so we can actually see the entire thing. So notice there's a lot of lines of code here. There's a reason I started with a simpler version. And we're going to try to highlight each of these sections in a way to correspond with what we were talking about before. So the first thing we have, this for each vertex, color it and assign some stuff, is the initially decide that no vertices have been visited. So that stuff I've highlighted in mint green there corresponds to initialize all vertices as undiscovered. The next thing we do where we're doing some stuff with S has to do with the fact that we are starting our search at S and then we create our queue so that we'll do that in a, another color now. So we create a queue. We then, the middle of this looks roughly like code already. So the next section is doing exactly what we said before. Let's highlight a couple of the things that are worth mentioning. We say we have now, we said this is we have no finished exploring you. That's what I'm saying now finished exploring you. Uh, so that that part is easy enough. That's when we color it black. There's nothing special about that. So we've now finished exploring you is this thing where we color it black. The remove you from Q is again directly translated into code. So I can color that in, I don't know, this darker blue maybe. Running out of good colors. So we remove it from the Q and then 
The bulk of what this is doing is this for each vertex thing in the middle there that looks a little scary. So that is the discover each vertex adjacent to you. So we are running low on colors. Maybe we do that in gray because it'll have some nice meaning to us later. So all this stuff here is the direct correspondence. So let's zoom out so we can directly see what's happening. And we're going to try to directly translate this. You can imagine the, the stuff up top is sort of the comments describing what is occurring. Now, let's talk about the code. That first for loop initializes every vertex as white, meaning it's undiscovered. It initializes this thing called D. That's actually the distance the vertex is from S. How far in terms of number of edges is it from S? So we say every vertex is undiscovered, infinitely far away, and it has no parents. So a bit depressing of a start. <laughs> and then we initialize S, the thing you told us about as an argument to the function, as we're processing S, it's where we started, so its distance is zero, and its parent is going to be nil. A common way in trees to represent the root of a tree is to represent it as the parent pointing to nil. That is one of the most common ways of doing this. We then create our queue, like we said before. We're then going to keep processing stuff until we finish the graph. So what are we doing in gray? That says, if we look at it very closely, for each vertex in the adjacency list, so for everything adjacent to you, if it is white, that means you've yet to discover it. So if it is white, we color it gray, and we say, well, it's one away from whatever the heck you is, because we're at it, we're going along one edge to get from u to v, so it is one further away. And if we went along u to v, then the parent of v has to be u. So this is going to help build the tree and I correctly identify some distances. This will be a little more clear when we start walking through it with an example, but this is the idea there. Before we do our example, the runtime for this might look like it's going to be really awkward. We haven't even talked about how you analyze running times for graphs. It turns out it's not too bad. So we're going to do some approximations here that are very reasonable and can be gotten rid of if you wanted to do be more rigorous, but we aren't necessarily delving into how you analyze graph algorithms so deeply. So we say for each vertex adjacent to you is what we are doing here. This is for each adjacent vertex. You may remember in one of my earlier graph videos, we said that the degree of a vertex is the number of things adjacent. So this loop, no matter what, runs degree of u times. No matter what, it runs that many times. So that's our first observation is that it runs that many times and the inside takes either some constant amount of time when it's white and some other different constant amount of time when it's not white. No matter what, it takes constant, though. You aren't doing anything in there that is a non-constant operation. We are assigning variables, and we are in queuing to a queue. You can dequeue and in queue in constant time. So everything takes constant time. It may be two slightly different constants, but we could bound it if we really cared. So this loop takes degree of u time. The line above of dq and the line below of black also only take constant time. So we can mostly ignore those things. Like as we've done in the past, we really only care about the most nested statement, the most complex statement. So all of the code between lines 13 and 21, we're gonna say runs degree of u times. And now here's a little bit of a clever trick, which is, how many vertices get processed? We know the cost now of the body of the loop. We just need to figure out how many times does the while loop run. The while loop runs, if the graph is connected, it's going to touch every vertex. It's exploring the graph. It goes through every single vertex. So we're going to run over every vertex. We're going to run over every vertex in the graph. We're summing over every vertex in the graph. And inside, we have the degree of that vertex. That notation might be a bit dense, so let's rewrite it in maybe some more familiar notation. That's saying we're running over all the vertices. And if we add up the degree of those vertices, and as a quick aside, we're going to let n be the number of vertices to save ourselves a bit of pain there. For now, that summation, it might look a little weird with the number of vertices on the top. So. We've actually seen that exact summation before. If you remember the handshaking lemma, that adds up to 2m. So that says that the cost, this is actually the running time, of those loops is just 2m. So this entire while loop takes 2m, where m was the number of edges. Let's add that in. So m 
is the number of edges. I apologize for not writing that down earlier. So we have that the running time for the while loop is two times m. So it's going to visit every single edge. That's unsurprising because it is going to just explore the graph and exp in exploring the graph, it should probably visit every single edge. Similarly, what we want to do is look at the remaining bits of code. So that's all the while loop does. All the stuff between seven and 11 is constant time operations. And then we have this loop at the start that runs through every vertex except for exactly one in the graph. So this loop up here in Ming Green runs n minus one times and each one takes constant time. So we have n minus one times c plus a bunch of constants plus two n. So the running time of this algorithm, t of m comma n, because, because it has two variables, is two m plus c times n minus one. So it depends upon both the number of vertices and the number of edges. That should be a bit unsurprising, only because we're trying to explore the entire graph. And we didn't really say what explore meant yet. We just said we're trying to look around the graph and discover stuff. And if we haven't said what we're looking for, then of course we need to look at every single edge and every single vertex. So the runtime we say is in theta of m plus n, or sometimes written as v plus e because you run over every vertex and every edge if you want to write it in a different manner. So that is our runtime for depth first search. This analysis you may not have come up with on your own. We've done much more focus on here's much more straightforward loops. In practice, we're trying to translate whatever our code does into something like this. So this is, our, this is one of our first forays into here's an actual algorithm. We need to try to find a way to convert it from a more concrete bit of code into something that looks more like a summation or just a direct for loop. So that's sort of the trick we were trying to do here. So our runtime is n plus m. This is a fantastic running time. Like I said, it's effectively optimal if we're searching the entire graph. You can't do better than looking at every edge and every vertex.